Welcome to this particular class. Uh, in this class, we will see uh, the substrates that are used to fabricate this biomedical devices. Because uh, as the name of the course suggests that we will be looking at the mathematical aspects of biomedical electronic system design, you should understand uh, what are the biomedical systems and if you understand what are biomedical systems, then you will understand that what are the uh, different parts integrated into a particular system. Now, uh, most of the system that we develop uh, uh, that has either a sensor or an actuator, right? So, <clears throat> if I talk about uh, micro sensors, then how to integrate or how to design and fabricate those sensors is something that is of importance. Now, to do that, we will see where exactly this uh, fabrication happens, what kind of uh, laboratory environment you require and then we will also see uh, what are the substrates that are used to fabricate those sensors. Substrate is a base material on which you can fabricate different layers uh, so as to realize a, a sensor, right. So, if you see, if you see the slide, uh, this topic will cover introduction to clean room and overview of microfabrication process. So, as you can see in the slide, uh, whenever you want to enter a clean room, it is very very important that we avoid as much contaminants as possible and the way to avoid contaminants is by following the clean room protocol. When you talk about clean room protocol, the first thing and foremost thing is how to wear the gowns, how to wear clean room, clean room hood or gown and then how to uh, wear the gloves, it can be uh, safety glasses, cap, hood face mask, uh, boots and shoe covers. This all comes under PPEs or personal protective equipment. Now once you uh, understand the process of how to uh, enter the clean room, uh, you will see that, uh, uh, that within the clean room uh, there are several equipment uh, such as uh, thermal operation, uh, uh, EVM operation, there can be sputtering. Uh, CVD which is PECVD, LPCVD, MOCVD, uh, that would be oxygen plasma systems, uh, there would be uh, chemical benches were for wet etching and dry etching, uh, then uh, there would be uh, a parallel deposition system, you will find a photoregist spin coater, you will find a mask aligner or photolithography system, uh, it can be for front uh, uh, lithography or it can be front to back alignment and litho do perform lithography. Uh, then we also have the RIEs which is a dry etching, either it is reactive and etching for chemical, uh, so uh, using chlorine, it is called chlorine etcher, if it is using fluorine, it is called reactive and etching uh, for fluorine uh, and then we, the final is uh, you will see uh, in a clean room a deep reactive and etching system. Again all the things that I am talking about are the technology, are the equipment that you will find when you are inside the clean room. The, there is a role of each equipment at certain point of time and I will try to cover few of the things um, uh, and then we will associate those things with the, uh, with the theory and see that how uh, the understanding of mathematics will help us to understand the design and fabrication of devices. So, having said that uh, a few of the similar world class facility you will see around that uh, we have at IISC are uh, from one from Berkeley you can see they have about 11,500 square feet of uh, 1000, 10,000 clean room facility and uh, it is it's a, it's a unique facility uh, uh, which, which works on biomedical uh, micro electro mechanical systems and of course microfluidic devices. Uh, they work on medical diagnostics, analytical chemistry, proteomics, genomics, cell biology. Uh, then we have another lab in Israel, uh, Wiesman Institute of Science. Uh, these are some of the clean room laboratories that I am talking about. The reason of showing you this particular slide is to make you understand that uh, uh, there is a huge investment in this particular research area, uh, uh, particularly as it is uh, linked with the healthcare technologies. And when you talk about healthcare technologies, all these healthcare technologies would have at some point of time uh, they use sensors and they use actuators or transducers, alright. So, uh, there is another uh, 
Nano Technology Center from Purdue. Uh, it's called B I R C K. Uh, I'm sorry you cannot see the full uh, screen, but it is a B I R C K. And uh, from Fuji Electric, uh, we they have a Fuji F U G I uh, BioClean. Uh, so uh, this is a clean room uh, that they have. The entire building is a clean room. Right, so it's it's a it's a full class facility that we have right, what I'm showing in this slide. However, the the point of showing you this slide is also to make sure that um, uh, the same things we have uh, at Indian Institute of Science. And uh, uh, if you if you uh, go to the IASC website and clean room facilities, you will see the similar kind of facilities we have everything under one roof. Having said that, let us uh, come to the actual uh, terminology and the terminology that we will be utilizing in this particular uh, course would be on micro and nano. And the micro means one uh, meaning of meaning is one millionth uh, or uh, in the another uh, terms you can say 10 to the power minus 6. When you say nano it is meaning one billionth or in another term you can say 1 to the uh, 10 to the power minus 9. Uh, now, uh, if I want to give you a very simple example of microns, then I'll, I'll, I'll just show it to you in the next slide. However, just uh, quickly understand that this uh, uh, micro and nanotechnologies are used in several areas from molecular manufacturing to nanotubes to medicine, uh, nanocomposites uh, uh, and finally electronics whether you talk about advanced CMOS, silicon transistors or uh, uh, microfabricated devices for uh, several applications like pressure sensors, uh, then we have uh, actuators uh, which we can have piezoelectric actuator or piezoresistive actuators, uh, we can develop a transducers like uh, PMUDs or CMUDs and so on and so forth. So uh, as I said in the last slide that what, how exactly or how large is one micron. So uh, human hair is close to 50 to 70 microns and uh, that is the thickness of a human hair ok. And then when we talk about uh, pollen it is about 30 to 50 microns, uh, our dust mite uh, is about 10 microns and ragweed is around 17 to 30, 23 microns. So if I take if I talk about one micron you can see the dot that you see on this slide this dot right white dot. Uh, within this red circle is 1 micron. Now, uh, comparatively within 1 micron in today's uh, uh, with today's technology of developing uh, uh, several transistors, uh, we have we can accommodate billions of transistors onto this 1 micron. Single micron will have millions of transistors. Uh, so, that means that uh, if there is a dust right uh, falling on this one particular uh, one, one micron area it will kill few transistors right it will kill few transistors so that's why we should require a clean room facility so uh, now when you talk about clean room again you have to understand that there is a indicator circuit because half of the uh, uh, things in electronics that we see today are all ic based and when you talk about indicator circuits then you have to understand that indicator circuits are made up of uh, the, the base material is silicon. Now we have different materials uh, and, and there are SOI wafers, there are gallium nitride wafers and, and many more. But um, the basic still remains, the base still remains as silicon, 90% of the industry still uses silicon as the base material or as a substrate. And um, uh, if we are going to make different devices then you can also use glass as a substrate, you can use plastic as a substrate. Uh, then uh, the, the silicon uh, substrate again if you want to divide into further uh, steps then there are four basic steps. First is the production of electronic grade silicon, second is the crystal growing, third is polishing of wafer and the fourth one is slicing of silicon wafer. So, right from the uh, sand to silicon what are the process right there are two techniques uh, if you have uh, understood the uh, uh, if you are already have undergrad degree or you are learning uh, we are in fourth semester or fifth semester sixth semester uh, you must have learned the VLSI technology and design in that you will see there are two techniques called the CZ technique CZ C and Z and then there is FZ FZ right so CZ stands for Zokralski technique or flow and FZ stands for float zone technique depending on the pronunciation it will be different but the techniques remains the same that these are techniques to uh, to to realize a silicon wafer right from the send so send to silicon what is the process that is shown in cz and fc technique so you can see here uh, the slide shows the uh, uh, the left left topmost slide shows the send right this is a send and uh, through send these are the glass uh, crystals and uh, uh, this is this is glass right very easy to see and what is this this is oxidized silicon oxidized silicon wafer 
oxidized silicon wafer. That means you have a silicon wafer. If I draw cross section of this wafer, right, it will be the one that I am showing you here, right, silicon. Now, if you uh, if you do a oxidation process, we'll look into uh, oxidation process in in um, uh, either this class or another class. You will understand that when you uh, when you heat the wafer at uh, 1100 degrees centigrade, and if you part pass oxygen and oxygen reacts with silicon, it, it gets SiO2. So silicon plus O2 gives us SiO2. This is dry oxidation process. Now there is a wet oxidation process in which you have silicon. Uh, plus H2O gives you SiO2 plus H2. Now you see we have to balance the equation, so you said 2H2O, right? So you have SiO2 and H2 gas comes out. This is when you use water vapor to grow silicon dioxide. Silicon plus oxygen, this is a dry oxidation because here there is no water vapor. In the second equation, we use water vapor, that's why I say Si plus 2H2O gives SiO2 plus uh, H2. Right, and then uh, what you see further is uh, that we will we will now uh, show a thermal oxidation technique in which you can uh, uh, grow the uh, silicon dioxide layer onto silicon substrate. So when you grow silicon dioxide layer onto silicon substrate, you will see like this. This is your silicon dioxide, silicon dioxide, and the silicon is there. So, the, the wafer that you see in, in this particular uh, picture, let us say if we name it the first one, second, right, third and fourth, then the fourth picture that you see here, right, is an oxidized silicon wafer. Hmm. Let us go to the next slide. Okay, these are the racks of silicon wafer. Racks of silicon, uh, rack of a silicon uh, wafers, uh, uh, all stacked together, and it can uh, vary from 25 to 50, depending on how many silicon wafers you can, uh, you 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 want to oxidize in one time. You can do oxidation of all the silicon wafer in one go, uh, in something called uh, or in a process called thermal oxidation, which uses. Uh, horizontal tube furnace. So, we will see that process. Uh, here you need to understand that how the silicon wafer looks like. All right. Now, why we are again looking into this particular system or the techniques is to understand that silicon will be used as a substrate to fabricate several devices and once you have devices, you can uh, integrate those devices into biomedical systems and then we will look at the mathematical aspects of how to where we can uh, use different uh, basics. Uh, of, of the uh, math into this biomedical system to understand uh, the several important properties uh, into healthcare. All right. It can be a tissue property, it can be a cell property, uh, when you use AC versus DC, how the properties would change, how you can create a model, how it can fit with the data and lot of uh, understanding about those uh, aspects. Uh, but before that, if you take any integrator circuit, you will generally find that when you open this integrator circuit, this is a casing, right? this one is a casing. If you open the casing, what you will see is that uh, there is a small chip right uh, uh, which is uh, uh, on the uh, integrated onto this particular casing and then there are wires like this connected to the external lead these wires are nothing but wire bonded right to the external lead and this wire bonding uh, is done by something called wire bonder as the name says wire bonding wire bonder right so this uh, connection to your fabricated chip is done through the wire bonding mechanism uh, there will be wedge bonding there will be uh, the different kind of bonding mechanisms but you cannot do soldering or uh, uh, press fit contact in this case you have to rely on wire bonding so once you bond the wire these are your external leads lead 1 lead 2 lead 3 that you use for uh, different processes. right? So, uh, uh, what we see further is that when you want to use silicon, silicon wafer as a substrate, yeah, it sizes from right from 2 inches, the dimension changes from 2 inch all the way to 18 inch. Now, when I talk about 2 inch or 3 inch or 5 inch or 6 inch, 8 inch, 4 inch, 12 inch, 18 inch, what does I mean? I mean that the, uh, the inch says about the diameter of the wafer. Okay? What is the diameter of the wafer? So, uh, the uh, four, for example, if you take a 4 inch diameter wafer and if I see the cross section of 4 inch diameter wafer, the thickness would be close to 500 micrometer. All right. The thickness will be close to 500 micrometer. This is we are talking about the thickness of silicon wafer, 4 inch silicon wafer. That means that uh, if, I, if I take silicon wafer and if I measure diameter, it will be 4 inch. 
hmm, 4 inch diameter. So, this is what it uh, means and then the, the photo shows different kind of uh, wafer size available in market. Uh, now, as I told you that uh, to fabricate these devices, uh, we have to require, we have to have facility which is called clean room and uh, is a facility ordinarily utilized for, uh, for, for doing research, for cheap manufacturing and industrial production of microfabricated devices. It is also used heavily in pharmaceutical uh, fair, you know, industries uh, uh, to, to create drugs. And uh, when we also talk, talk about clean room, you, to un, you also have to understand that it is a facility that controls the particle count, contaminants, relative humidity to achieve more efficiency in fabrication of devices and of course, with repeatability. Repeatability, efficiency uh, both goes hand in hand. If there is no repeatability, there is no point of having more efficient process. So, that is what we are talking about. Uh, if you see again in the slide, I do not think you can see on the right side. So, uh, can you just Move me out, please, on the slide. Uh, Mary Aminash, can you please? Yeah, thank you so much. So, here you can see that uh, depending on the particle count, the clean rooms are categorized as shown below. Uh, generally, it is categorized based on the particle per cubic feet, and it goes uh, depends on the, uh, uh, the particle per cubic feet, either is 0.1 micron particle or 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 1, and 5 micron particles. And you can see that as you go towards the lesser number, that means class. 1 is cleaner than class 10, class 10 is cleaner than class 100 and class 100 is cleaner than 1000 to 10,000 to 100,000. Uh, uh, so, in class 1 and class 10 as you can see that uh, almost 5 micron particle is not existing, 1 micron is just 1, 0.5 micron is 1 uh, uh, and then uh, uh, 0.5 micron in class 10 is 10 in 0.3 micron 30, 0 0.275, 0 0.1350. But the, the, the purpose of showing you this slide is to understand that the, the clean rooms are further divided into several classes based on the particle per cubic feet. Right? Uh, and depending on that, there are several standards right from ISO 1 to ISO 9 and uh, ISO 3 is for class 1 environment, ISO 4 is class 10 uh, and ISO 8 is for class 100,000 uh, environment, ISO 9 which is uh, just a clean room air. Uh, that means that uh, if you go to a clean uh, laboratory right uh, and the air that you find it out uh, uh, hoping that it is clean right uh, you can give the laboratory ISO 9 certification in terms of class but when you want to create a clean room you have to make sure that the particle counts falls within this particular uh, uh, parameters so as to uh, uh, make sure that the device is not or uh, the chip is not deteriorated the contaminants are minimum now uh, having said that, uh, when you work in a clean room, uh, we will just quickly see this slide, so that you understand that uh, the working uh, and the protocols of the clean room. Uh, what you do not have to do, that is very important, see in, uh, in, in uh, most of the subjects that you take, it is very important to understand what not to do also, right, and what to do. So, if you are in the clean room, uh, you cannot wear makeup or you can uh, do not wear sandals, right, uh, you are not allowed to bring coats, hats, backpacks, uh, bags, uh, uh, all these uh, items should be stored in the office or the lockers outside the clean room. You cannot wear dirty clothes, particularly muddy boots or shoes. Uh, uh, never unzip a clean room gown to retrieve an item from the underlying garment, right. Uh, allow uh, always follow the lab protocol and safety is very important. Uh, now, if you want to create a clean room, the, the question should be how can one create a clean room or uh, class 10 or class 100 kind of clean room facility. So, the answer to the question is by using uh, uh, a filter called HEPA. HEPA stands for high energy or high efficiency particulate air filter and is one of the most important component of the clean room and the way the HEPA filter works is by absorbing the particles at the air inlet of the clean room and this supplies the filter air through the clean room to maintain temperature, pressure, humidity. Uh, another thing is very important in the clean room if you see it is a air shower. When you enter the clean room, the air shower will help to uh, bombard the person with a flow of filter air and this in, in this bombardment will result in dislodging the particles. It can be dislodged also for an object it can dislodge skins and, and clothing uh, and, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, then another th thing that when you see the clean room, I think I will just uh, send you a video of how the clean room looks like, how to enter the clean room, what are the protocols within the clean room, how the pass box works and everything. So, for now just uh, understand that when there is a pass box is used for passing the material from one side of the clean room into other side of the clean room. So, if you wear all these gowns right, uh, the whole clean room uh, uh, hood and then you, you do not have to, uh, if you do not want to go inside, you can open the pass box, put your item, close this door, let the person inside open the other door and uh, that person can retrieve the material. So, it, it ensures the uh, that only one door will be open at one time and thus uh, the uh, passing of the material is possible. Next one is about the air flow and you can see in this particular schematic that the air flow uh, which is a laminar clean room flow uh, uh, is very important. Uh, in this case the air is introduced uh, and recirculated in clean room after removing dust from the HEPA particle HEPA filters. You can see here the, uh, uh, the air comes from here it passes through the HEPA filters right and usually the filters and ducts are made up of stainless steel and uh, to ensure num uh, minimum number of particles. Uh, also uh, separation of particles from the air during recirculation of air is difficult and that is why uh, uh, it will create due to the turbulence right because if you, if you send it back it will create a turbulence. Uh, so, th to avoid that it is only unidirectional flow is allowed and multidirectional flow is not allowed. So, if you see the unidirectional flow is shown here right to avoid the uh, turbulence uh, and uh, uh, the next slide when you see that what are the clean room parameters you will see that the, the particle count is one of the very important parameter along with the relative humidity which generally lies between 30 to 40 percent. Uh, we also have uh, uh, the narrow band of plus minus 2 percent that means it can go to uh, 33 percent it can go to 42 percent or 38 percent or uh, somewhere in that range. So, so, plus minus 2 percent is allowed. So, the point is 35 plus minus 2 40 plus minus 2. Right, uh, and uh, the important factor is that you have to strictly maintain the uh, the temperature also. Generally, it is below 20 degrees centigrade in between 16 and 19 degrees centigrade. Now, if you talk about sources of contamination, uh, there are several sources of contamination. The biggest source is uh, the person working inside the clean room. All right. So, and this contamination generates from several things, right? From the materials that we use in the clean room, which can be aerosols, which can be water, it can be cleaning chemicals, wipers, tape, dusters. Uh, stationary and many more things. It can generate out of degassing, evaporation of chemicals when we use wet benches, when we go for a physical vapor deposition like sputtering, e beam, thermal evaporation, we will see and uh, uh, understand uh, some of those uh, in this particular course as well. Uh, finally, the tools uh, that generates because of the friction generation particles uh, or lubricants and finally, the people uh, that are working inside the clean room uh, because of the oil, perfume, cosmetics, uh, hair, lint and fiber from clothes, this all are the sources of contamination inside the clean room. So, as I told you earlier the restricted materials within the clean room are fried from the paper, pencil, fabrics, uh, wet and dirty clothes, uh, loose clothes, dangling jewellery, everything is not allowed right uh, within the clean room. Uh, the counting procedure I will send you the video just you look at here. Uh, uh, now, I am sure that most of us we know how to wear a mask right, uh, it should be above the uh, nose uh, not covering your eyes of course, uh, and uh, it should cover your mouth. Um, then uh, you have a hair net and you, then you have a, uh, a gloves, you also have a safety glasses, a clean room shoes and a gown right. So, this is a gowning procedure, gowning and PPE, PPE stands as I told you earlier, it stands for personal protective equipment. So, gowning procedure should be strictly followed for the person safety as well as to save the fabricated device from human generated de, uh, contaminations. Uh, uh, you understand that if there is a loose clothing, there is an entanglement hazard. Uh, secondly, uh, wet hair net, lab coat, gloves and booties, you can see that uh, uh, this uh, all these things would be there in the clean room. Uh, and once you wear everything uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, this is how the uh, person should look like uh, when when he or she is wear, uh, wearing a uh, clean room uh, gowns right and along with the PPEs. So, uh, further in PPE we have to also understand the face shield, we have to understand the, uh, uh, the mask, uh, the gloves right safety glasses. Uh, and a face shield is used when we go for the wet etching. Generally, when there is an acid bench, 
uh, there is extra protection that we go have to take. Uh, same thing uh, we have to wear different kind of gloves uh, particularly when we work in uh, the acid band environment right. Uh, and uh, uh, the another thing that we need to understand is that working at a wet benches you have a three different kind of gloves. One is nitrile gloves, one another one is MEPA gloves and last one is the F Teflon gloves while the latex and vinyl gloves are not allowed inside the uh, clean room. So, uh, the uh, few more slides on understanding the safety issues because it is very important whenever you understand a biomedical system you should understand what are the safety hazards and uh, it starts from the MSDS which stands for material safety data sheet. Uh, all the chemicals that you used all the materials that you used within the clean room or even in the lab uh, would have a MSDS data sheet. You can see it you can see the temperature boiling point melting point uh, depending on the material of course uh, and uh, you have to be careful whether it is explosive or not, uh, whether it is corrosive or not, whether it is flammable or not, right. Uh, if it is a gas cylinder, if it is a environment then there is a, a, uh, aquatic toxicity, uh, when there is a acute toxicity you will see a, a symbol skull or crossbones, right. When there is an exclamation mark that means that there is a skin sanitizer, sensitizer, uh, acute toxicity is there, uh, there can be respiratory tract irritant can be there, uh, right. Hazard to ozone layer can be there is exclamation mark. Then the another symbol that you see health hazard which is right here uh, that will uh, when there is a carcinogenic material inside, when there is a mutagenicity, when there is a reproductive toxicity, respiratory sensitizers, uh, target organ toxicity, aspiration toxicity then you have this kind of symbol and finally you know this uh, symbol very well is a flammable, it is a flame, flame symbol stands for flammables, uh, it stands for self heating, emis flammable gas, self reactive organic uh, peroxide. So, these are all the symbols that more or less when you see in the lab you will know that this is for that particular uh, uh, that the, the lab has that those particular uh, uh, you know materials uh, with that particular uh, explosives or corrosive or flammable materials inside the uh, ecosystem and then you need to take care accordingly and wear the PPD, PPEs accordingly. Now, uh, you have four blocks here as you can see on the screen right the leftmost block which is a blue one right the blue one shows that it is a health hazard and it can be deadly extremely dangerous hazardous it can be slightly hazardous or it can be normal material if it is deadly you give a 0.4 if it is extremely hazardous or uh, extremely dangerous material you can give 3 if it is hazardous 2 slightly hazardous 1 and normal material then you can say 0. Uh, if it is red it stands for fire, fire hazard uh, if it is uh, uh, below 73 degree then uh, you say that it is 4, uh, if it is uh, below 100 degree Fahrenheit then 3, below 200 degree Fahrenheit 2, above 200 degree 1 and will not burn it is 0. Uh, instability, the yellow one shows instability whether it is uh, detonate, detonate then it is 4, shock plus heat 3, uh, violent chemical 2. Uh, unstable if uh, heated is 1 and stable is 0. This 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, uh, 0 that I am talking about is all the corresponding uh, you know uh, right from deadly to normal alright. So, 4 is extremely deadly and then uh, is normal, but in case of fire we have seen that what are the flash points that uh, if it is uh, uh, 200 degree that means that before that it will not, not uh, catch the flash and uh, that is why we have uh, numbering like that. Uh, okay. So, having said that the last one that we have left here is a specific hazard which is a white color box and here you can see that uh, it can be for oxidizers, alkaline materials or you should not use any water or simple um, you know uh, aspartide uh, or it can be acid, it can be corrosive, it can be radioactive. So, then we use a white color box, <coughs> excuse me. Okay. Now, we talk to uh, wet bench protocols. So, the most important thing is that in the wet labs as you can see in the screen right uh, you are not allowed to do this alright. You cannot wear the uh, uh, PPEs and work in the wet bench with a mobile in hand and talk it to someone. Next thing is you can you should no, never put your head within the within the wet bench because what happens is there is a uh, 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 vapor right that because of the boiling of the chemical that vapors we will uh, breathe in if you if you uh, if you will have the head within the uh, wet bench. So, you have to take care of this issues when while working in the wet benches you see this should not it is not a storage area right it is a it is a wet bench to perform the experiment you should not store the chemicals like this it is not allowed at all. So, 
uh, and finally, you should never rub your eyes or touch your belongings wearing contaminated gloves. You always follow the MSDS data sheet. Uh, do not pull your face, uh, do not put face or head inside the hood. Very, very important. You should never do this, never. All right. Uh, do not use cell phone and uh, be uh, cautious when you use chemical hoods. These are something that is very e easy to understand that we have studied in chemistry. Right, the dilution of concentrated acid is exothermic and it releases heat. That means you should always add concentrated acid to water. Don't uh, add water into concentrated acid; otherwise, it may explode. And always uh, remember the triple A principle. That means that always add acid A A A to water. Right, uh, you should be careful while you are using the clean room environment. Finally, if there is a chemical spill, um, then there is a spill on floor or spill on person. If the spill is on floor, then you have to use a dilute with your water and supply chemicals, uh, chemical spill pillows which are already available in the clean room. If there is spill on person, then wash under safety shower and seek medical attention. The most important or dangerous spill is HF spill, HF stands for hydrofluoric acid and this spill is highly dangerous due to ex internal tissue and wound damage. Uh, you have to wash with large amount of water uh, removing contaminated uh, uh, gown and, you do, uh, and then finally, apply calcium gluconate gel and seek immediate medical attention. So, <coughs> the last safety that we have to see is electrical safety. Now, I, I really want you to understand this thing because when you when we look at the uh, clean room protocols and the fabrication process to uh, for, for several devices, uh, this all things comes at a later stage. First is how to work inside a clean room, what are the clean room protocols, what are the uh, safety issues and what kind of safety that we need to take care of. Uh, before we uh, start looking at the experiments, right? So very important. It's not only for this course; it can be applied for many, many courses. In fact, wherever you are working in your lab environment, make sure that all the safety issues are taken care of. So uh, you you can see that as many of the tools use high voltage supply, practicing the electrical safety is extremely important, right? This is absolutely not allowed. What you see here, right? Wet hand is there, and uh, we are we are using the. Uh, power and then you can see there is a dangling wire absolutely not allowed, cut wire not allowed. We generally try to do these things uh, often uh, we have seen you may have seen, but this is not a good practice to use the uh, multiple things from one single source right. Uh, I, particularly when it is like this broken right is hanging it is not correct all right. Uh, so, there can be danger when it is hazardous voltage you will see this kind of symbol right. Uh, if it is a uh, electrical hazard you will see this right. If it is a uh, uh, you have to keep out uh, from electrical hazard then this is a symbol. Then severe shock hazard is this one, high voltage is this right, uh, no uh, loose connection right and then you have a hazardous voltage. So, this is the symbol. So, the point is uh, you, uh, learning electrical safety and of course, the uh, uh, all the other uh, safety that we have discussed till now is very important part of this particular uh, uh, clean room uh, protocol. So, we had to learn that. Uh, fire safety all of you now uh, I am sure that you know it. Uh, for those who do not know it uh, we cannot use uh, 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 the uh, any kind of fire extinguisher to uh, you know to remove the fire to extinguish the fire. So, the point is if there is a fire you have to trigger the alarm leave the building immediately do not return to the building until authorized do not use elevators use fire extinguishers right. And uh, in, in, in particular uh, if, uh, uh, symbols found on the fire extinguisher and what they mean. So, if you have a wood paper a textile uh, kind of material uh, that is on fire then you can use the uh, fire the fire extinguisher which is your water you can use a foam spray you can use uh, the ABC powder and you can use the wet chemical you cannot use carbon dioxide if it is wood paper and textile same thing. Uh, if I go for the uh, flammable liquids, if flammable liquids uh, catch fires, then I cannot use water, water is not allowed. I can use foam spray, uh, AVC powder, uh, carbon dioxide and wet chemical is not allowed, right. Uh, same way for flammable gases, electrical safety and cooking uh, oils and fats. So, uh, all things are on the slide, you can easily see, you can go back and look at the lectures and understand that how the things are done. Now, when you use a fire extinguisher, always understand that uh, uh, is a uh, term called PASS, P A S S. PASS stands for pull the pin, then uh, uh, aim the nozzle, right, squeeze the lever slowly and sweep from side to side, right. So, this is how it is uh, uh, written PASS, P A S S. Uh, 
uh, and uh, the, the then the very important uh, point is biosafety hazards. So, uh, when you work in a clean room you see you will see biosafety hoods these are called biosafety hoods it and its uh, safety level is biosafety level 1 to biosafety level 4 right. So, you can see here uh, depending on the uh, uh, experiments that we will perform right uh, we will show it to you how biosafety level uh, biosafety hood looks like. Uh, but uh, it, it stands from BSL 1 to all the way to BSL 4 we what we will show you is BSL 3, BSL 2 BSL 2 hoods we will show it to you as a part of this course and uh, uh, you can see that BSL 2 are microbes that are typically in, uh, indigenous and associated with disease of varying se uh, severity for example, staphylococcus. Uh, if I have BSL 1 then I can use some strains of E. coli, but if I have my tuberculosis bacterium or uh, which is called mycobacterium or it, uh, if I have if I am working with Ebola or Marburg viruses then I have to go for BSL 3 and BSL 4 accordingly right. Uh, if you want to use tissues whether it is a heart tissue or it is a brain tissue you can use BSL 2. Uh, PPE is for biosafety uh, if you see the task versus potential consequence for this additional PPE you will understand that what are the tasks and what are the potential consequence for which you require the additional PPEs. Uh, it makes no sense for me to uh, read line by line because it is very clear from here that uh, you have to understand what are the tasks and what are the consequence and depending on that whether you would like to have the additional personal protective equipment or not. Of course, uh, excuses are not uh, acceptable you have to follow lab protocol and you should never make your own protocol right uh, some of the photos just to show that this is not a way to work. Uh, finally, when we talk about microfabrication process we will see several things right from wafer cleaning uh, to the oxidation process which is thermal oxidation process. Then we will look at the deposition techniques uh, uh, the photolithography technique uh, we will look at the etching RI, DRI and then bonding, dicing, uh, releasing. And, uh, uh, and also we will understand right from concept to the fabrication to the testing and then once you have the device and you use the device for uh, certain application let us say we want to understand the uh, electrical, mechanical and thermal property of tissue right then what are the uh, mathematical model that can be used for uh, fitting the data, fitting the curve and uh, those things we will take it at a certain point of time. So, we will try to cover most of the things uh, which are related to microfabrication process uh, that are used to fabricate your devices uh, and uh, having said that uh, this is the last slide of this particular class. Uh, in the next class we will actually start to use the uh, silicon wafer and I will show you how we can uh, how, how what are the process to fabricate those silicon wafers and also we will take the concept of uh, uh, photolithography uh, and, uh, elect uh, and the deposition techniques for metal deposition, semiconductor deposition and insulator deposition uh, and we will see how we can pattern different materials onto silicon substrate so as to realize either sensors or transducers in detail. All right. So, till then you take care look at this class this is mo mostly like introduction to the clean room protocol, clean room safety right uh, and the microfabrication process. So, till then you take care uh, I will see you in next class.